Everybody knows that King David sinned with Bathsheba and then had her husband killed. But have you ever wondered how he had those sins forgiven since he lived before the sacrament of penance was instituted? How was he saved? Everyone heard about the police in Boston. When the bomb went off at the marathon, they wouldn't let the priests near the people injured by the bomb. Have you ever wondered what you would do, what you could do, if you found yourself dying without a priest, which is pretty realistic in our day and age, and you had sins on your soul, mortal sins? What would you do? Could you be saved? Have you wondered what what you could possibly do to help a dying non-Catholic friend or relative who doesn't want to see a priest be saved? Could they be saved? Today we're going to answer those questions and do so. We'll rely largely on two works. A booklet entitled Perfect Contrition by Father Quirigen S.J. A booklet entitled The Golden Key to Heaven by J. De Dreisch. They're both readily available uh, for download on the internet. They're maybe 20, 35 pages, not very long. Perfect Contrition, Golden Key to Heaven. They're really worth reading. Obviously, there's a lot more information in those two uh, booklets than I can get through in a sermon. In a sermon, as usual, I've cut, spliced, and edited things. Let's start with a review of our catechism. What is contrition or sorrow for sins? Contrition or sorrow for sin is a hatred of sin and it's a true grief of soul for having offended God with a firm purpose of sinning no more. Now, supernatural contrition may either be imperfect or perfect. Contrition is imperfect when we're sorry through fear of God. We are sorry for having offended God because we fear his just anger and his punishment. We don't want to go to hell. Contrition is perfect when we're sorry through love of God because sin offends him who's so infinitely good and lovable, which brings us to the topic of the sermon, perfect contrition. Perfect contrition springs up from a perfect love of God, and our love for God is perfect when we love him because he's infinitely good or worthy of all love or because by his innumerable gifts to us, he has shown his love for us. On the other hand, our love for God is imperfect when we love him because we hope for some benefit from him. When our love is imperfect, we love the gifts we received. When he's perfect, we love the giver of the gifts, not so much for the gifts that he's bestowed on us as for the love and the goodness that these gifts manifest towards, it manifest towards us and that are in him. The effects of perfect contrition. We're going to talk about how to make an act in a minute, but I want to talk, precede that by talking about the effects. Suppose a man is in a state of mortal sin, and then he makes an act of perfect contrition. At that instant, just like that, all his sins are forgiven. He's back in the state of grace instantly, even before he goes to confession, assuming he has intention of going when he has the opportunity. Perfect contrition is a fantastic help to all those who really want to stay in the state of grace, but who through weakness and in spite of their good intentions occasionally fall into mortal sin. All right, even if someone has made an act of perfect contrition, he shouldn't go to communion until he's gone to confession. His sins are forgiven, but he should go to confession first before he returns to communion. Now suppose a man is already in the state of grace at the moment that he made that act of perfect contrition. What happens then? At that point, then, his soul is strengthened against future temptations. His venial sins are forgiven. His purgatory time is decreased. And the charity, the virtue of charity, grows. The more fervent the act he makes, the more time he lo- is reduced in purgatory, and the greater the growth in charity. That's when a man makes one when he's in the state of grace. Is it easy to have perfect contrition? It is more difficult to make an act of perfect contrition than to make an act of imperfect contrition. That's true. We have to make an act of imperfect contrition at least to have 
or the sacrament of confession be valid. There, there's something called defective contrition. We preached on that before, but just to remind you, the difference between imperfect contrition, which is we're sorry because offending God and we really don't want to get punished or go to hell, and defective contrition is we don't have a per- firm purpose of amendment in defective contrition. So a person could go and say, well, I'm sorry for my sins because I don't want to go to hell, but I don't want to get rid of the cocaine or whatever. You know, I mean, the, the two things don't go together. If he's trying to confess something, he has to get rid of it. That's defective contrition. He's sorry, but he's not sorry in a way that the, that the, the, the sacrament will work. Imperfect contrition, though, where he's sorry because he's afraid of hell, that suffices to get the sins forgiven in, in, in confession. But when we make an act of imperfect contrition, we're, no, it, we're not, unless we're in confession, it doesn't move us into the state of grace. Okay, so it is more difficult to make an act of perfect contrition than to make an act of imperfect contrition. Fervent Christians can make acts of perfect contrition more easily than lukewarm Christians. But perfect contrition is not difficult for someone who has begun to be sorry for his sins. Perfect contrition is not beyond the power of any ordinary man of goodwill who's trying to live well, but is too weak to always avoid mortal sin. Before Christ came, the only means for adults to have their sins forgiven was perfect contrition. And even now, that's still the case for all those who, for whatever reason, do not have access to the sacraments. God has not imposed upon mankind a requirement for sorrow for sins that's beyond the power of even the weakest man of goodwill. Anyone who really wants to make acts of perfect contrition can, with the grace of God. Only one thing can make perfect contrition difficult to us, and that's a lack of trust in the mercies of God. But doesn't our Lord call us to trust him? That's the whole point of him appearing to St. Margaret Mary, the Sacred Heart devotion. That's the whole point of him appearing to St. Faustina. He wants us to completely trust him, even on the painting. From the divine mercy, what does it say? Jesus, I trust in you. How to obtain perfect contrition. First off, we have to remember that perfect contrition is a gift of God. It's a great grace. We therefore should ask for it constantly. Ask and you shall receive. When we beg God for some worldly favor, he may refuse. God knows what's best. I pray and pray. I want to win the big jackpot in Atlantic City. God says no. He knows what's best. But a prayer for perfect contrition will always be heard. A prayer for perfect contrition will always be heard. Here is an easy way of making an act of perfect contrition. Now, this is a salvation issue, so we should listen carefully. We kneel down before a a crucifix, or at least in our mind's eye, we place ourselves at the foot of the cross. And then while we're looking at our Lord's wounds, we think for a few moments on what we see, And then we pray something along these lines. Who is this nailed to that cross? It's Jesus, my God and my Savior. And look at how he's suffering. Look at those wounds. Those horrific wounds. And why is he suffering? For the sins of mankind. He's suffering for my sins. I have sinned against him. And yet, as he's hanging there in such agony and pain, he's thinking about me. He's suffering for me. He's making reparation for my sins. He is busy loving me. And then we remain there at the foot of the cross where the blood of our Savior falls drop by drop on our soul. Ask ourselves, how have we returned these proofs of his love? Call to mind our past sins. And forgetting for a moment heaven and hell, we just place that aside. We want to repent because our sins have caused our Savior to suffer so terribly. We promise him that we're not going to crucify him again. And then slowly and fervently repeat that to contrition. 
or better yet, just repeat whatever words of sorrow that rise up from your heart. Now, how hard is that? Every single person here can do that. Another easy way of making an act of perfect contrition is to turn to Our Lady. But think of her as Our Lady of Sorrows. They're on Mount Calvary. They've taken Our Lord's body down, and it's laying there, mangled, dead, on her knees. And we look at her. We turn to her. And we just say with her, O Blessed Mother, pray for me. Obtain for me the grace to never sin again. My Jesus, have mercy on me. My God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I love thee above all things. That's not hard. Anyone here can do that. Okay, now let's apply what we've learned to three situations. Three situations. First, helping a dying Catholic make an act of perfect contrition. Second situation, helping a dying non-Catholic Christian make an act of perfect contrition. And third situation, helping a dying non-Christian make an act of perfect contrition. We're assuming that a priest is not available. That's a pretty good assumption. Or that they don't want to see a priest. Okay? Parenthetically, you should pray to get a priest when you die. God's in charge of that stuff. But this is what we do to help people when that isn't happening, okay? So the priest isn't available or else they don't want to see a priest. They're not Catholic. So what should we do? Well, no matter what you're dealing with, in each one of these situations, you start by praying to your angel and to the dying man's angel and ask them to help and to intercede with St. Joseph and Our Lady. We're trying to do something supernatural. We need supernatural means. We go right to the source right away. Do that right away. That's first. Then if he's conscious and responsive, follow the advice of St. John Eudes, and you want to say something along these lines. I'll pray with you. It probably doesn't matter much to you, but would you mind if I prayed in your name? It would sure make me feel better. Okay? I'll pray with you. probably doesn't matter much to you, but it, I, would you mind if I prayed your name? It would sure make me feel better. Don't fret if he refuses to let you pray in his name. But if he does, he's just agreed to make you his advocate before God. And so you have real leverage. But if he doesn't, don't worry. Just stay calm. The devil works in stormy waters, not the Lord. We have to stay calm. When we're working with someone dying, it's really important to stay calm. Really important. You just don't want to give any more leverage to the devil than he's already got. So no matter what the situation, start by praying to the angel and the angel of the dying man and ask them to help and intercede with St. Joseph and Our Lady. Then if he's conscious and responsive, you follow the advice of St. John Eudes and say something like, I'll pray with you. It probably doesn't matter much to you, but would you mind if I prayed in your name? It sure make me feel better. Now let's go through the possibilities. So first, helping a dying Catholic make an act of perfect contrition. If you have any holy water, sprinkle it around. Generally speaking, you don't have to be sneaky with a Catholic on this. It's holy water. Why do we want to sprinkle holy water around at this point in time? Because it keeps away the devils. And when someone's dying, it's just like flies in a dead carcass. They're just all kinds of them. And the holy water keeps them away. You don't have to worry about it. That's the whole object. When people are dying, you just sprinkle it around. It keeps them out of the room. It keeps them away. Because the devil knows it's his last chance. So they're just swarming. And that holy water will keep him out of the picture. Okay? So once you've done that, you just ask him to repeat with his heart what you're going to pray. So you slowly and distinctly ask our Lord to help. Ask St. Joseph to help, ask Our Lady to help, and then ask our Lord to have mercy. So, Blessed Mother, help. St. Joseph, help. My Jesus, have mercy. My Jesus, have mercy. Mercy, my Jesus. And then after this, just say an act of contrition very slowly and deliberately. If he's in action in the throes of death, this can be repeated periodically, but don't get yourself excited. Don't allow yourself to be excited and think you have to just keep on doing this to the point of exhausting the dying man. Stay calm. It'll be all right. Just ask him to squeeze your hand if he wants you to pray it again with him, okay? That's all you have to do, just slowly and deliberately. You want to go slow. If he's unconscious, you do exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing. The last sense to go is actually the sense of hearing. 
So make sure you're slowly and clearly pronouncing each word when you ask him to repeat with his heart what you're about to say. Don't talk at a normal speed. Talk very slowly. Then slowly and distinctly ask Our Lady to help. Ask St. Joseph to help. Ask our Lord to have mercy, and slowly and distinctly say the act of contrition, even though the dying man may not seem to hear or understand you. Don't worry about that. You're not looking for responses here. You're looking for the response with heaven. So that's the first case, how to help a dying Catholic make an act of perfect contrition. Second case, helping a dying non-Catholic Christian make an act of perfect contrition. If you have any holy water, this is where you might need to be a little sneaky. This is pretty easy. Our Lord told us to be gentle as doves and wise as serpents. So just wet a cloth with it and wipe off his forehead. You're good to go. Okay? Then tell him you want to pray with him. Do you want to help him call on the name of the Lord? Again, just ask him to repeat with his heart what you're about to say. Don't say anything about an act of contrition. Don't spook a dying man with strange vocabulary. You don't want him to close his heart. You want him to open it. We're not sitting here trying to score debating, Catholic debating points. That's crazy. We're trying to save a soul here with the grace of God. So you slowly and distinctly ask our Lord to have mercy because you've already prayed and you're all, silently to Our Lady and St. Joseph, the angels. They're already involved. So you just, my Jesus, mercy, my Jesus, mercy, my Jesus, I'm sorry for any and all the ways I may have ever offended you. Throughout my life, I beg you to have mercy on me. I'm truly sorry and I love you. Have mercy on me, Jesus. You'll know what to say, stuff like that, okay? Again, if he's in action that throws a death, uh, you can repeat it periodically. Don't exhaust him. He can ju- just have him squeeze your hand if he wants you to repeat it. If he's unconscious, you do exactly the same thing. That's the second case, helping a dying, non-Catholic Christian make an act of perfect contrition. And if he unites yourself to it, that will be an act of perfect contrition, and his sins will be forgiven. Remember, the more fervent that that act is, which isn't like how much energy you put it, but the more fervent, the less purgatory time he has, too. So that's why it's not bad if he wants it to repeat, because he can reduce it. But you don't worry if he's going to be in purgatory at the end of the year, who ca- at the end of the world, who cares? Because he can't confess to a priest. He, he, but Christ is still looking to save him. So he'd be his instrument in this case. Finally, the most dicey one, helping a dying non-Christian make an act of perfect contrition. Again, if you have holy water, you're going to have to be sneaky about it. Just wet that cloth and wipe his forehead. Don't baptize him if he doesn't want to be baptized. It isn't going to work. See, children uh, can't raise an obstacle to that, but an adult can. So at past the age of reason, it's not a magic trick. If he doesn't want to be baptized, you're just, it's a sacrilege. Don't do it, Okay. We're, what you're trying to do is obtain the grace for him to make a baptism desire. We're assuming he doesn't show any desire to see a priest and doesn't show any desire to be baptized. If he wants to be baptized, well, that's a different sermon. Go ahead and do that. I mean, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're assuming this is a person that doesn't want to be baptized, okay? So, if he's baptized, he's good to go. But uh, here's a dying non-Christian. There's no time to catechize because he's dying. Tell him you want to pray with him to help him have a peaceful death. Obviously, this is a much more dicey situation because he doesn't necessarily explicitly believe the four truths. He certainly doesn't believe some of them. They're necessary for salvation. There's one God. God rewards the good and punishes the evil. There's three persons in the one God, and the second person, our Lord Jesus Christ, became man and died for our sins. Well, he obviously doesn't believe that or he'd be a Christian. Uh, you know, so you, at best, you got three, and that'd be amazing. You, you, know, you, you might have two. You don't know where you're at on this. Okay, so he doesn't know all that or at least doesn't believe it yet. If you can explain these four points and he's receptive to it, well, then by all means do so, but then you're no longer dealing with a non-Christian. So it's, we just got done with that possibility. So the, the situation we're speaking of right now, he's a non-Christian, it's dying, It means he don't have, not in this situation to run a catechism class, and he doesn't know that Jesus is God, or at least doesn't profess that. You don't have the time to get into that now. What you're going to do is bank on the marvelous mercies of God. If you can get the man to make an act of perfect contrition, he will then be in the state of grace, and you're trusting that God will in some way enlighten him, enlighten this dying man as he dies, okay? You are shooting for last-minute save. You've already prayed to the angels. They're busy talking things over with St. Joseph and Our Lady. God desires the salvation of all men. He doesn't want this man to go to hell. He's looking for an excuse to save this soul for whom he shed his precious blood. And so with the grace of God, you're doing your best to open that soul to a movement of grace. Okay, so that's the goal here. So unite yourself to Our Lady. And then just lean on her and tell your dying friend you want to pray with him to help him have a peaceful death. Then just ask him to repeat with with his heart 
what you're going to say. Don't say anything about the act of contrition. So, look, if he'll accept you praying explicitly to our Lord, that's good to go. But we're assuming in this, too, I'm giving you all the possibilities that you're not even going to, that that's not going to happen. So it might be a Jewish friend, might be a Muslim friend, right? So we slowly and distinctly pray something along these lines. Have mercy on me, God. Have mercy on me, God. Oh, God, I'm sorry for any and all the ways I've ever offended you in my life, and I beg you to have mercy on me. I'm truly sorry, and I love you. Have mercy on me, oh, my God. Now, we know what we're praying, and if he's united to it, we're good to go. If he isn't actually in throes of death, it can be repeated periodically. You just have him squeeze your hand. If he's unconscious, again, we do exactly the same thing. Make sure we're slowly and clearly pronouncing each word when we ask him to repeat with our heart what you're about to say, and then slowly and distinctly pray those prayers. Huh? If he actually cooperates with you, he's going to be moved into the state of grace. And we can trust the mercy of God that somehow that poor dying man will receive the knowledge he needs to be saved before that soul leaves his body. So that's the third case. How to help a dying non-Christian make an act of perfect contrition. Let's review. What have we seen? We've seen that if a man is a state of mortal sin, he makes an act of perfect contrition, all his sins are instantly forgiven. We've seen if a man is already in the state of grace and makes an act of perfect contrition, then his soul is strengthened against future temptations, his venial sins are forgiven, his purgatory time is decreased, and he grows in the virtue of charity. And the more fervent the act, the more the purgatory time is reduced, and the greater the growth in charity. We've seen that perfect contrition springs from the perfect love of God, and our love for God is perfect when we love him because he's infinitely good, infinitely beautiful, infinitely perfect, or because by his innumerable gifts to us, he has shown his love for us. We've seen that before the coming of our Lord, the only means for adults to have their sins forgiven was perfect, tradition, perfect con contrition. And even today, it is still the case for all those who, for whatever reason, do not have access to the sacraments. We've seen an act of perfect contrition is not beyond the reach of even the weakest man of goodwill. We've seen that we can easily make an act of perfect contrition by kneeling down before a crucifix, at least in our mind's eyes, and while looking at our Lord's wounds, pray along these lines. Who is that nailed to the cross and suffering so terribly? That's my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And look at how he's suffering with a body so covered with those terrible wounds and his soul and agony and humiliation. And why is he suffering? He's suffering for the sins of men. He's suffering for my sins. I have sinned against him. And yet, despite this fact that my sins nailed him to that cross, he's hanging there in agony thinking of me. He's suffering for me. He's making reparation for my sins. He is loving me. And we stay there in prayer while that precious blood falls drop by drop onto our soul. We recall our past sins and repent because we can see what our sins did to our Lord. And we promise him we're not going to crucify him again and then slowly and fervently repeat the act of contrition. We've seen that if we're going to try to help a dying man make an act of perfect contrition, we start by praying to our angel and his angel and ask them to help intercede with St. Joseph and Our Lady. Then if he's conscious and responsive, we take a cue from St. John Eudes and say something like, I'll pray with you, it probably doesn't matter much to you, but would you mind if I prayed in your name? It would sure make me feel better. We remain calm, whatever his answer, then if the dying man is a Catholic, we sprinkle some holy water around to keep away the devils. Then we ask him to repeat with his heart what we're going to pray. Then we slowly and distinctly ask Our Lady to help. We ask St. Joseph to help. And then we ask our Lord to have mercy. My Jesus, mercy. My Jesus, mercy. Mercy, my Jesus. And then we say very slowly and deliberately the act of contrition. We've seen if the dying man is a non-Catholic Christian, we tell him that we just want to pray with him. We want to help him call on the name of the Lord and ask him to repeat with his heart what we're going to say. We don't say anything about acts of contrition, no Catholic vocabulary here. Then we slowly and distinctly ask our Lord to have mercy. 
my Jesus, have mercy. My Jesus, have mercy. My Jesus, I'm truly sorry for any and all the ways I ever offended you throughout my whole life. And I beg you to have mercy on me. I'm truly sorry, and I love you. Have mercy on me. We've seen if the dying man is a non-Christian, we're going to do our best to open that soul to the movement of grace. And since he's dying, we're going to bank on the tremendous mercy of God. If we can get that man to make an act of perfect contrition, he'll then be in the state of grace, and we trust that God will enlighten him some way as he dies. We unite ourselves to Our Lady until our dying friend, we want to pray with him to help him have a peaceful death. Then we ask him to repeat with his heart what we're about to say. And then slowly and distinctly we pray something along these lines. Have mercy on me, God. Have mercy on me, God. God, I'm sorry for any and all the ways I ever offended you in my life. I beg you to have mercy on me. I'm truly sorry, and I love you. Have mercy on me, God. Okay. Let's close. Close by thinking about two scriptures. In 1 Timothy 2.4, we read that God desires that all men be saved. God desires all men to be saved. And in Acts 2.21, we read that all those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God desires all men to be saved, and whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We know these scriptures, but most of the people don't. Most of the people around in, in, amongst whom we live are in total darkness or varying shades of twilight. We've been given these great graces. We've been given the true faith. And now you have the knowledge that if you find yourself in this situation, you can be instrument of the mercy of God to bring that person to eternal life. God desires that all men be saved, and whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved.